I just want to say something before I get into the message. Today's a very special day for my wife and I. And I just want to say a few words about my wife. A lot of times as pastor, you know, she's in the background sometimes and she doesn't get noticed. And that's fine. She's in there. She's doing things. You know, as long as I'm pastor here, you know, she's a pastor's wife. But if something ever happens to me, she's no longer a pastor's wife. And she's, her life changes. It does. doesn't mean she can't minister. We're not saying that. But she's no longer a pastor's wife. And I just want to say I appreciate her. I love her. Um, when I first came to this church, they, the pulpit committee asked me some questions. And one of the questions was, was this. What is your wife going to do? And I gave an answer to those men. I think Brother Don's the only one that's left here in the church that was part of that pulpit committee, brother. <laughs> and I don't know if he remembers the answer to that question, but this was my response to the men that were congregated in that room when I talked to them. I says, read the qualifications of a pastor's wife. They looked at me strange. You don't see any. Not that she shouldn't be a godly woman, but all you women should be godly. And I said, number one, she is my wife. Her primary responsibility is to God, then to me as a husband. Does that mean your wife won't be involved? No, that's not a statement to that effect. Does she play the piano? Does she teach science school? Does she do all these things? She needs to be my wife. God commands that. She needs, she's my help me, according to the book of Genesis. Because I don't know about you, but in marriage, you, if you understand this, we all, both of us have, both husband and wife have strengths and weaknesses. We do. And where I'm weak, she's strong. Where she's weak, I'm strong. It's just, wow, you say, how does that work, you know? And I can't say it's, uh, you know, we can say with absolute certainty that every marriage, that is always the case, but a lot of times it is in our personalities and so forth. Amen. So I just want to say I, I love you. 41 years. 41 years. And thank you for, thank you for, I mean, the ladies uh, supporting my wife and being there for her and fellowshipping with her. Amen. And uh, it's hard to believe wow, this year will be 25 years this November 18th, pastoring here at New Testament. And, uh, and as far as pastoring altogether, uh, it is 29 years, September 1st, in the province. So it's been a, I'm here for the long haul, if you're waiting for me to leave. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, you know. And uh, as long as you compare those qualifications as pastor, uh, in the Word of God, and make sure that I follow those qualifications. I qualify, I'm qualified, and that you as a congregation want me here. I'm here. Amen. So I appreciate you. I appreciate your support over the years. Appreciate the things the church has done for my wife and I. You folks have been generous. Uh, when God was able, you know, through you to work and supply different needs, you've done that. People have sacrificially given. They've taken offerings up over the years that I've been here as pastor. And I don't, I don't, I don't forget that. And I appreciate that. It's been a long haul. It has been. But you know, through it all, you know, I, I look back at some of you. Some of you here, you've been here for a while. You're kind of like the pillars of the church, so to speak. <laughs> you've been through the thick and thin. You've been when the times were lean, and now you're still here. I'll tell you something, that's, that speaks a lot for you. Thank you for sticking this thing out. We haven't arrived. We're not arrived till we get there. Amen. amen. We're not even arrived. This is not a statement. Oh, we got it, you know. <laughs> amen. But the reality is, thank you for your faithful support, your faithfulness. And, uh, you know, in, in the midst of even your own personal difficulties. Isn't that right? It's not that no one here has any personal difficulties. But when you have personal difficulties and you have church difficulties, that really compounds the situation. So I just want to say those few words there again, just appreciate that. And um, anyway, so thank the Lord. If you're married, amen. I know you might not get the opportunity that I have to stand behind a pulpit and to say what I just said, but I hope you show that appreciation. It's one thing to say, I love you. It's another thing to show it. 
Amen. There's got to be some action to those lips. Amen. It's the lip in life. That's what you need. That's the same with the Christian life. Everything's lip in life. Tell the truth. Say the right words, but also show it in your life to each other. Amen. Appreciate each other. Don't ever take anyone for granted. Your kids, kids, your parents, your parents, you appreciate them. Let's not wait for Mother's Day in May or Father's Day in June to appreciate your mom and dad. I hope you write little notes and I hope you mean it from your heart and you tell them, I love you, mom. I love you, dad. Amen. You know, boy, I'll tell you, it's so, so important to appreciate the people that God has put in your life and never forget it. Amen. Amen. Okay, listen, we'll get to the message now. Um, if you were with us last week, we talked about this very important principle, and I'm not going to rehash it all. The Bible teaches of a principle that I call, I don't know if there's another theological term. If you know of one, let me know after the service. The ownership of God. And we talked about that. We're not going to go through. What does that mean, Pastor? What doesn't he own? What doesn't God own? The Bible says in, in uh, Psalm 55 that he owns the cattle, or Psalm 50 owns the cattle, the beast of the field, the forest, the cattle on a thousand hills, the fowls of the mountains, uh, the wild beasts of the field. They're mine, they're mine. He says, they're mine, they're mine. Reminds me of that one movie that, I know, Disney had there, and the seagulls were saying, mine, 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 mine. Yeah, it's his, it's God's, not theirs. This is all God's. Everything is the Lord's, everything, everything. This chair, this building, like I've said so many times, everything you possess, if you're saved, listen, it's all God's, it's all God's. You've got to understand that principle. If you don't understand that principle, that everything comes from the hand of God to us, comes right from his hand. And when it comes back to, to, to giving to the Lord, we're giving from his hand. We received it from his hand. You've got to understand that principle, and we give back to him. Why do we need to give back if he owns everything? To show that you yourself understand this principle that it's all his, and he's blessed you. Let's remember him by giving it back to God and the work of Christ. That's what we need to do. Amen? And you ought to do it, not grudgingly. As the Bible tells in 2 Corinthians 9, we ought to be a cheerful giver. Amen? That's what God wants. Amen? And I, I, I hope that reflects in your life. And just in case someone may want to, you know everybody, what everybody's given here? No, I don't. Okay? That's between you and the Lord and the people that, have, that count the offerings. Okay? But the reality is, listen, every, every time you give, you're showing how much you appreciate God. You say, I can't give much. I don't have much. Give what you can give there. Amen? Like I said a few minutes, a little bit ago, the, the widow gave all that she had. And we would all understand the situation of a widow. How would, I, I would feel guilty taking all that a widow had and receiving that as a pastor if that widow offered that to me to bring to the church. I've had seniors do that to me because they can't come to church. I say, would you deliver this offering to the church? Yes. And if that was all they had, I would feel so guilty. I would feel so bad. But that's, that was in their heart to do that. It's a heart matter. It always has been. Amen? So we talked about that. Amen? All of creation, the planets, everything is God's. Amen? And of course, if you're saved, the Bible says those who are redeemed. We're re you're redeemed today. You've been purchased. You've been bought with a price. Paul wrote in the Corinthian believers, you've been bought with a price. What is the price? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. You've been bought. You've been purchased. You're not your own. Amen? As I've said so many times, and I've already mentioned husbands and wives, when you get married, you're not your own. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7. You're married. You're not your own. What's that about? That's about marriage. That's about a husband and a wife. Amen? You're supposed to render due, due benevolence both ways. It's mutual submission. It's what it is. People are like, well, I'm the man of the house. Really? Yeah, you don't read your Bible, do you? You only read the parts you want to read and preach and talk about. Amen? Don't get on a power trip. That's not the place here. The reality is this, mutual submission rendering due benevolence, and you don't have power of your own body. That's what the Bible teaches, and I won't go into details. That's for an adult session. Amen? But that's what the Bible teaches. And if we can just understand those matters, amen? So you're not your own. In marriage, you're not your own when you're saved, and you don't own anything. <laughs> yes, I do, Pastor. In God's way of looking at things, you don't. It's all His. Amen? So remember, it's His. Show that you appreciate what you have received in proportion. So the Bible teaches. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, you'll see that. 
They gave proportionately. There's a whole bunch of teaching and preaching. We're going to get into that, but not today. Today, we're going to expand upon the fact that not only are you not owners, but we're also stewards. We're stewards. So why did you have Brother Hazen? Some of you have been with us. Some of you have been with us for a while through COVID, and you've heard some of this, so just bear with me. Maybe you might see something or hear something different, or, and you say, oh, I don't remember pastors talking about that. Okay, so be patient and wait. If you know it, praise God. Hope you're applying it. That's, that's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road. Apply the truth. Let's, let's not talk about it. Let's, let's live it. Amen? So in this passage here, here, uh, Joseph, a, a beautiful picture of Christ in many respects. We won't go through that. Um, he had a great responsibility, but yet he was tested. He was tested by adversity. He was tested by many things. You know, when you study this life of Joseph here, you, you, you'll see that in Joseph here, uh, he entered Egypt at the age of 17. He was uh, at age 30. You read that in Genesis 41, uh, 46. It mentions that. Let's see here, 41 verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old. It's interesting. Christ entered the public ministry. You read that in the Gospel of Luke when he was about 30 years of age, the Bible says. Interesting, amen? A lot of beautiful pictures, and so many preachers and Bible teachers have expounded upon that. We're not going to get into that. And uh, so anyway, and uh, he left for glory. He died, went to be with the Lord at 110. How about that? 80 years, amen? 80 years. Can you imagine that? This is what Joseph lived in Egypt. 80 years out of 110, and uh, so, anyway, um, there's a lot we can say about Joseph, but I want you to see some. He had a great responsibility. Potiphar, who is an Egyptian uh, e official, as a matter of fact, uh, they, they kind of say he's like the, ca he's the captain of the guard, verse 1 there. You see that, officer, captain of the guard. Um, he's like the secret service, like a chief of police. If you, you know, some of these terms that we use in our modern vernacular, uh, he was a highly trusted official in the government of Egypt, okay? So when you look at the life of Joseph in the Bible, by the way, some of you who are new at Christianity, this is not the Joseph that uh, was married to Mary and had baby Jesus, okay? So just make sure you understand. Some people don't know that. They think, oh, Joseph, are you talking about, you know, uh, Jesus' stepfather? That's what he was to Jesus. Amen. No, we're not talking. We're talking about an Old Testament character. Amen. One of, one of the sons of Jacob. Amen. And uh, so anyway, uh, the Bible says that um, uh, he was brought, of course, in that verse one, the hands of the Ishmaelites. Uh, they brought him down there. Verse two, the, the Lord was with Joseph. Is the Lord with you today? Is the Lord with you today? Amen. You know what? Um, with all the stuff that Joseph already faced up to this point, you know, and all that he went through, he realized, you know, God did not abandon him abandon him in the smallest way. God hasn't abandoned you. If you're saved, you're his. The Bible says that he's with you, whithersoever you go. It's over there in the Old Testament. The Bible says that G the Lord tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 that he's with, with us all the time. Amen? He'll never forsake you. How about that? In Hebrews chapter 13. Amen? He's with you, even though you're going through troubles. Amen? And uh, you know what? And then the Bible says he was a prosperous man. So even though he went through all this, you know what? God made him a prosperous man, even though he was sold as a slave. Can you imagine? The Ishmaelites came by, and the brothers said, you know, they had that little discussion. They wanted to kill him there, but anyway, things changed. They said, here, why don't we just sell him? Sell him as a slave there, amen? And uh, so anyway, but uh, praise God, amen? So you know what? Some people think that unless I'm a person in authority, I can't be blessed. Well, this is a proof, a case in point that you can be blessed even though you're not in a person of authority yet. He's gone through all these different things, amen? But it's through that these things that happen that J Joseph ends up, I mean, there's a lot more that takes place. He gets thrown in jail and all this kind of stuff. We're not going to go on those details, but the reality is, you know what? He went through some rough times, really rough times. And the Bible even teaches us that. You know, Jesus lived and taught the principle that life is a servant. We ought to serve Christ, and we ought to have a servant's heart and a servant spirit, amen, with people that God puts in our life, whether it be in the home or out of the home, amen. I got to say in the home because we think, you know, that's a different scenario, so therefore we don't have to serve each other. No, everybody should be serving everybody in the home. 
Kids need to learn that too, parents. Make sure they learn how to serve, not just be waited on. Amen. They can get up. They can set the table. They can help out. They can unload the dishwasher if you got one or help dry the dishes. They can help doing things. They can help sweeping the floor. They can help taking out the garbage. Amen. It's not just for themselves. It's to help and serve others. Amen. And that's what the Lord wants us to do. And, and so Jesus said it's, a, it's a, all about uh, being a servant. The Bible says, he said, whoever was great among you, let him be your minister in Matthew 20, 26. The Bible tells us that uh, even as the Son of Man, in verse 28 of the same chapter of Matthew, he said this, he says, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. And then the Bible even tells us, uh, even its titles, Jesus the Messiah, but one of the most meaningful is, behold, my servant. How about that title, amen? You find that in Isaiah 42, 1, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Even in Philippians 2, the Lord tells us through Paul the Apostle to that letter to the church at Philippi, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not Robert he'd be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, servant. That's what it was, was made in the likeness of man and being found in fashion of a man as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even unto the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things of earth, and things in earth, and under the earth, that, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He was highly exalted, but he, he humbled himself. God manifest in the flesh, lived 33 and a half years on planet earth. He went through all the temptation that any human being could ever go through, but yet passed the test where the first Adam failed the test. Amen. I'm glad he passed. Aren't you glad he passed? Because he passed, he could be your redeemer. He could be the propitiation for your sins. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Listen, I'm telling you, I thank God for that. He did. He didn't fail. They even said, hey, you're the son of God. Come down from the cross. You can take care of that. You perform miracles. And we talked about the, the other thief on the cross that got saved. Amen. Boy, such simplicity. He said, no, my daughters and I, we've sang a song. We haven't sung it in a while. He didn't come down. Oh, no, he didn't come down. 10,000 angels were kept all around. He could have called them and set him free. But he died on the cross for you and for me. Aren't you glad he didn't come down? Oh, I'm so glad he didn't come down. I'm glad he stayed on that cross for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise God. Verse 3 of Genesis 39, and his master saw the Lord. Was there. Do people see that the Lord is with you today? Do they see that when they look at you and say, the Lord is with that person? Amen. They, they saw it, the master, and the Lord made all that he did, uh, and that, uh, that he had, uh, did prosper in his hand, amen? And then verse 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, he served him. He made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, he had put in into his hand. And it came to pass, and by the way, that's a description of a steward. That's what that is, it's a description of a steward. And then verse 5, and it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house, over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. You know, sometimes that God will bless a certain business or a certain uh, group or uh, whatever situation because you, the believer, you're living for God. People know the Lord is with you and God will expand his blessing to those who are interacting with you, even though they're, they don't know God. How about that? You know, the Bible teaches us in the book of Romans, the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. And as I've said so many times, the world, the devil, the flesh wants to make God look bad. They say, they come up with all these things. Who, who is this God? Who is he? You know, what is, what, why, why would he let this happen? Why would he let that? All these different things that they throw at God. That's just the devil working to get people to say, God's not good. It's his goodness that draws people to him. He's a great God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And the Bible tells us, look at verse 6, and then we'll get into the message this morning. I just wanted to highlight some things on this passage. 
and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. So don't forget. So the principle here on stewardship is he has to manage. He's managing something that's not his. So right there is the principle of stewardship. You're managing something that's not yours. And if you haven't gotten past the first message and you still don't agree with the first message, you cannot accept this message. You've got to understand you're managing right now the money in the bank, however it is, whether it be cash, whether it be accounts in different banks, your assets, everything. You're managing things that aren't yours. That's what the, that's what the Bible teaches. It's God's. If you're saved, you know Christ, amen? Listen, you've got to understand that principle. It's all God's. God provided it. The Lord gave it to you. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Amen. Oh, there's so many things. Amen. We could talk about those pictures of Christ. Amen. And there are, they're there. As a matter of fact, there's 2,350 verses on finances and possessions in the Bible. It, the Bible covers pretty much everything. Maybe not in the modern vernacular with all the changes of words, but the principles are all there in the Bible. There, this book doesn't need any updating. The book itself, the Bible, all 66 books, there's so much truth in here. It will help you in any given situation. We did a whole series a while back on living by Bible principle. If you can't find a verse or a passage of Scripture that clearly teaches something related to what you're trying to make a decision on, whether it be um, you know, whatever problem in life that you're dealing with, then you have to learn by, to live by Bible principle. It's so, so important. Amen? Everything, you know, yes, you can probably go to the two commands Christ gave, what, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and also love your neighbor as yourself. And if you kind of boil everything down, that's what it, boil, that's what it is. Amen? But sometimes we want this thou shalt or thou shalt not statements. You don't get that all the time in every matter in life. That's where you got to learn to live by Bible principle. So, so important. Amen? So the more time you spend in the Bible the more you're going to understand that principle. Amen? These principles that God gives us. So, so anyway, so stewardship is most of the, the most simplest and basic of, of principles concerning material things, whether it be money, whether it be possessions that you have. So what is a steward? Very simply, you manage the property of others. A steward, Joseph was managing the property of someone else. That's what he's doing. You don't own it. But you need to manage it. How is the management coming? I didn't know I was a financial manager. I didn't know I was the chief financial, the CFO of my home. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are, chief financial officer. How are you doing? How are you managing what you got? Amen? And we looked at this. And so stewards can often enjoy the things that they manage. Amen? As we saw with Joseph, he didn't own anything in Egypt at this point. He was a steward of Potiphar. Amen? But that didn't keep Potiphar from entrusting him to, uh, to him all that he owned. And by the way, you say, I wonder why God hasn't given me more. Maybe because he can't trust you with more. Right. Some people don't like that. Amen? You want more? Manage well what you do have right now. Amen? To whomsoever much is given, much is required. God's going to hold you to a, a different bar of accountability. Amen? So manage what you do have. Amen? And it gets, it's getting tougher when the price, the cost of living is going up and all these things. Amen? I know, I know. We're, we're all in the same boat, so to speak. Amen? And uh, so we need to be careful. Amen? Um, so anyway, Joseph really gives us this beautiful picture and this model of, of, of a steward. Amen? A steward of, of, of someone else's wealth. And now God says, you're a steward. He calls us. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Listen, God says we are stewards today. You're a steward, okay? No, steward. They think different than owners, okay? So a steward would say this, knowing that when you get your paycheck, whenever that, whatever frequency that is, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, whatever it is, you know, every two months, annually, whatever, amen, um, you need to ask yourself this question, what does God want me to do with this paycheck, amen, amen, you may say that, um, but you know what, by the way, you should say this, what does God want me to do with his money, 
That's really what you got to say. It's his. God, what do you want me to do with this? And you need to pray about it. Amen? How does God want me to allocate what he's given to me? Amen? How does God want me to use this home that I, that's his? My home is his. My, how does God want me to use my car, which is his? How does God want me to use these things that he's provided? Because they're his. They're not mine. They're his. How should I use extra money? How should I save? How should I invest? How should I spend? How should I give, give it? All of this and more. Amen? How should I use it? You know, I was talking with someone yesterday. They were talking about getting a car. You know, the question is, should I buy this car? Should I buy it? Amen? You need to ask God. Should I buy this car with the money, with your money, Lord? You know, we need, we need to think, we need to, re, we got to rethink things, and we need to change our mindset when it comes to these matters. You know, this furniture, whatever it is you're thinking of purchasing, before you click that button on Amazon, which is so easy, amen? Amen? God, should I do that? God, give me wisdom here. He said he'll give it to you liberally. When in doubt, don't, by the way. Don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, you buy stuff on Amazon? Yes, I do. Amen. You know, um, whatever it is. Really, when it gets down to it, the size of the purchase is not the issue. Because it's all his. Well, that, that couple of dollars, yeah, it's his. All the money you have in your name is his. Everything is his. So, as a steward, you've got to think you got to think different than an owner. You don't own it. It's his. It's all God's. What matters is that all God's money, I have, you know, it's all God's money, and i got to decide. i got to make some decisions how he wants me to use his money <laughs> and his car and his home, <laughs> everything. Amen? Stewards think different than owners. Now, there's some specific areas about which stewards think differently than those who own possessions, and I'm going to bring these thoughts out to you, and so we'll go over these things, okay? Number one, since you're called a steward, let's look at some Bible principles about you and I as believers who are also called stewards. Philippians 4.11. Philippians 4.11. Philippians 4.11. <clears throat> Very, very powerful, I mean, of all the chapters, uh, so many good chapters in the Bible, but Philippians 4 is loaded. Wow. Some very common uh, verses, like verse 4, rejoice in the Lord all when again I say rejoice. Amen? Verses 6 and 7, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, um, and uh, with, your thanks with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then, what are you supposed to think about? Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Is it truthful? What are you, what are you listening to? What, what social media, what, what electronic, what movies, what news media, whatever it is you're feeling, you know, what goes in the, the, the eye gate, your mind, your hearing, it affects your heart. It does. What you see and hear affects your heart. And by the way, you'll talk about what you're watching and what you're listening to. Amen? And so he says, here's some things to think about. Whatsoever things are honest, verse 8, whatsoever things are just, pure, I'm just skipping, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these. Have you thought about those? Have you worked on those? Have you worked on that list? Maybe you need to do a to-do list. I need to get my mind back on these things. And uh, so anyway, um, he also says, we'll get to verse 11 in a minute, but we're going to skip down to verse, uh, there's so many more, verse 19. But, but don't forget, that's a conjunction. You've got to read the verses before and see the context of that. And by the way, it's all about giving, because you'll see that in verse 18. You'll see that in verse 17. I've marked those verses. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He owns it all, so he's got it all. <laughs> he's got it all. Amen. But verse 11 is the point that I want to focus on for a few moments. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Wow. Contentment in whatever state. 
to be content with what you have. Do you absolutely need this? Whatever it is, you're going to take God's money and spend it on. Is that good stewardship? That's what it boils down to. Are you content? Are you content? The world in the advertising industry breeds contentment. It does. I'm not saying what they're flashing in front of you is evil. Amen? But sometimes they portray these things in front of you and they put it in such a way that it seems like you absolutely have to have it. And the, with the advent of social media and the internet over the last all these years now, I remember when I first got on the internet when I moved to Nova Scotia shortly after we moved here in 94, I thought, wow, that was when you had the dial-up, amen? You remember the dial-up days, amen? Who's got those things? I know there's still probably still some people using dial-up in the remote areas of Nova Scotia, I'm sure. You know, what's happened is that there's so much going on on the internet, it knows everything you're clicking. And that's why, they, by law, they have to ask you, you, know, you accept all cookies or not? And it's not something you're going to eat, by the way. It's something You leave trail. You know how the kids, they took the cookies, and there's a trail on the counter, there's a trail in the kitchen floor, and the mouth is full, and you say, did you take one of those cookies? Yeah, you've got, it's in the mouth. The evidence is there. So the trail of cookies, crumbs. <laughs> amen. I don't know. Brother Marco knows all that, all that software stuff there. Amen. Anyway, so that's in there. So then you get these things flashing you on the sidebar, underneath, and I'm constantly clicking X. Get rid of that. I don't want that. Get rid of that. I have ad blocker. This page will not operate without ad blocker. I don't want to allow ads. <laughs> but that's how they make money. That's how people make money. Amen? So you get everything. You say, man, why am I seeing all these toaster ovens flashing? Because you went and looked on Amazon, or you went somewhere else, to saw, and you clicked, you saw a toaster, and the internet knows there's a history there, and they know you went there, you're interested, it's all of a sudden, toaster oven, toaster oven, toaster oven, ah, it's driving me crazy. I don't want to buy a toaster oven, change my mind. <laughs> amen. <laughs> That's the world for you, amen? But it does breed discontentment. We're not saying that whatever you're buying is not a necessary need, okay? But the reality is we need to, we need to be careful because it's his money. It's his money. It's not yours. It's God's money. Amen? Number two, stewards need to give. First one was stewards are grateful and content. That's the first point. Second point is stewards um, give willingly. They give willingly. Amen? Let's, let's go to the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles 29. I, I usually try to bring this verse out. I have, uh, I have mentioned it without turning to it, I believe, already. Um, but here's David. They've collected. They brought, he's got patterns for the temple. You know, one, one thing, you know, I know David messed up and all that, but praise God he got forgiveness. Aren't you glad that God put people in there like that? They messed up, they sinned, but God, they got forgiveness, but not without consequences, as I've already mentioned in the early hour, amen? And so, um, you know, David is encouraging his son Solomon to build a temple, but they did a big offering, they, took, they collected all of that, and the amazing part of that is, man, when they were cutting those stones in a remote location, when they brought them, the Bible says there was not a sound of a hammer, of a tool, when they put all together, everything was precise. Can you imagine? Come on. Listen, I don't know about you, but I've done a little bit of carpentry work. I'm not the best at it. Kind of in a way a jack of all trades, or most trades, not all, uh, but master of none, maybe, in some respects. Uh, there's times I got to, oh, I cut it too short. Oh, I got to cut another piece. And by the way, at the price of wood the way it is, you don't want to make too many mistakes. What's the old adage? Measure twice. Cut once. <laughs> Amen. There was no mistakes when they built the temple. Come on now. It was perfect. Cut in a remote location, and it came together. There was no parts missing. <laughs> My poor son or daughter, they got a Lego thing. They were missing a couple of pieces. If that happens, I don't know. I don't know how good Lego is. Or how about Ikea? You like Ikea, putting everything together? Amen? Sometimes I say, ah, I didn't read that. I got to take apart half the item before I can get to back to that part. Ah. 
Don't throw away the instructions, guys. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Read those. Don't hang on to those. Don't trash them. Don't burn them. Don't burn them. You might need those. Give up the pride. Amen. You will make a mistake probably. Amen. But you know what? It all fit. So what David's doing in chapter 20, he's exhorting the people. Amen. He's exhorting. They give verses 6 through 9. They give willingly. Amen. And then he's thankful. David's thanksgiving and his prayer is verses 10 down to verse 19. And so the Bible says in verse 10, wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, verse 10 of 1 Chronicles 29, um, and said, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth and is thine. He understood this principle of ownership. He says, it's yours, Lord. It's all yours. The, everything is yours, Lord. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great, to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Now, watch this. But who am I? That's a good question to ask yourself. Who am I? Who am I to think how big and great I am? Oh, we serve a great God. Oh, boy, you better ask yourself, that. Go, who am I? Who am I? I guess I'm a child of the king. Praise God. I love that song, too. Hey, man, that's a wonderful song. But listen, let's not get so full of pride. Hey, man, about ourselves and how we've done all these things. Listen, listen, if it wasn't, the Bible, you saw in my Deuteronomy passage, I think last week, he gives you power to get wealth. He gives you the breath of life. He keeps that heart going. He keeps that mind clear. Amen. It's God that does all that. You ought to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving me the strength to go to work this week or last week. Amen. And for tomorrow. Amen. You came out to church. Praise God. Listen, you're not in a wheelchair. You're not in a hospital room laying on a hospital bed. You're not at home laying on a hospital bed like our sister Enid, amen. At home, amen. You don't have a lift over your head to help you up. You don't have those things. Look at you today, amen. Oh, we got our health problems. We got our aches and pains. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But we're so, listen, you're able to walk. Praise God, amen. I would dare to say, I think everybody here, I didn't see any walkers this morning. We may be getting walkers for some, some of us, amen, someday down the road. I just say, well, come on, don't talk about that, Pastor. That's a season of life. Have you forgotten that? That could be you. Our sister Eleanor, she turned 97. Wow, 97 years old. Wow, look at us. Man, yeah, I got a long way to go for that one. This is the next month. I'm turning 67. She's got 30 years on me. The Lord tarries. Just think about that. It's like, wow. You ever think about those things? Some 97. Like, huh? 97? Brother Walker, this friend, like I mentioned it earlier. Amen. He was my age. He was born in 1956. That could have been me. That could have been me. It's not. Thank you, Lord. Now, God, if something ever comes, God, give me the strength. It's only by you, Lord, that I'm able to do it. It's only by you I'm able to do anything for you, Lord. It's never me. It's never just me. I need you every hour, the songwriter wrote. Do you need him every hour or you just need him for Sunday? Just need him every now and again, you know, just in case you get in a real mess in a pickle. And you say, like, oh, I need God now. I need, no, you needed him when you say, when you, you, in your mind, you didn't think you needed him. You need him every hour. You need him every day. There's never a time when you don't need the Lord. Why do we think that way? Why do we have that in our mind and our heart? He loves us. He cares for us. He keeps us alive. You need him all the time to watch what happens. Who am I? And what is my people 
that we should be able to offer so willingly after sources. How can we do this? They brought this offering. It was, it was amazing, amen. The things that people did, they did sacrificially. And that's always the case. Whenever you look at things in the Bible and study church history, Amen. And he says this, how can this be possible, Lord? How can people do what they're doing and giving? He, he answers the question, for all things, David said, come of thee. It comes from God. Amen. He, he's the one that we received it from. Don't ever think, oh, look at my hands. I'm so smart. I'm so strong. Look what I've done. Look what, how great I am. No, look how great he is. He's given me the abilities, and my mind is clear enough that I could go to school or university, and I could learn and understand these concepts. Amen? If it wasn't for that, you couldn't do those things. You could not do those things. Oh, we serve a great God. And he says, it's because of you, Lord. It comes from you. And he says this, and I love these last words of this last phrase. And of thine own have we given thee. Basically saying, God, you gave it. I recognize it came from you. Amen. And now we're giving back to your hand, so to speak. Amen. We received it from God. We give it back to God. And you know what that does? It shows that you love God. It shows that you, you recognize where it all came from. You recognize the ownership of God. You recognize you're a steward. You're not an owner. You're a steward, a manager for the things that God blessed you with. Amen. Use it for his glory. Use it for his glory. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners, verse 15. And we're, as we're all our fathers, our days on earth are as a shadow and there's none abiding. Don't forget that. That shadow passes. Amen. See that in the wintertime, the shadow. Oh, it's a lot shorter the days. Amen. It's getting a little longer now every day. Every day. Amen. You know, it's just a shadow. The other day, little Joaquin, we were at the house there. Little cute little Joaquin. He was walking around, and he saw a shadow. I thought it was like Peter Pan or something, you know. He's walking around, looking at his shadow. He's looking, around, looking on the ground. He sees a shadow, and he's just kept on walking around. He's looking around. Your shadow, life is just a shadow. It'll pass. Amen? All of a sudden, you see it, and it's gone. Amen? You see that light. I saw some beautiful light here last night as I was coming into town yesterday, yesterday afternoon to spend time with um, Enid there last night, and uh, my wife and I, and beautiful, I mean, I see those sun rays coming through the cloud, and I say, wow, that's beautiful. Hey, Lord, you said, you know what? We're going to meet you in the air in the clouds, amen? Maybe, maybe, could be, could be right now, praise God, it wouldn't bother me one bit, amen? I see those rays coming from the sun, I'm looking at that, I say, wow, isn't that good you can see that? Amen, poor Enid, had the clock there, and she's looking, and she can't even see the numbers on it. It's a big clock. Oh, I'm telling you today. You are, listen, you are blessed. Oh, I got to wear these. Otherwise, this Bible is a blur. These words on the page are a blur. The closer I bring it to the worse it gets. I got to hold it out here. I could start reading it, but then the fine print, the, the peak, uh, the 10, the 10 point print gets still blurry. The 12 point is pretty good. And I don't want to make big, huge printing here, but. You know what? You can see that. You can read your Bible. Somebody said, man, we need, I need a large print Bible, Pastor. Amen. I got some over there. Amen. Larger, not huge print, but good big print. You know what? They gave willingly. Are you giving willingly? Are you giving willingly? That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll talk some more about that down the road. Not grudgingly. Are you a cheerful giver? You say, thank you, Lord. You've blessed me so much. And God... You deserve it all back. God, I'll give you a portion back, remembering you, how good. And that gift that you give back to God, which is really his to begin with, is a reflection of how much you really love him. You show by what you're giving how much you really care about him and what he's done for you. That's what you're showing. Number three, number three, we've got to wrap up here momentarily. Number three, look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Don't forget... We're stewards, not owners. We're stewards, not owners. We're stewards, not owners. You don't own anything. You don't own anything. It's all his. Everything is his. Your life is his. Amen. You know what God says? And as you're finding that passage in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Bible says that, you know, the Bible tells us to 
offer ourselves to him. Amen. Is that what he tells us in Romans chapter 12? You know, he's begging, he's beseeching us by the mercy of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Come on, offer me. No, no, no. God, you think, well, God's going to force me to do something. No, he's not. He wants you. Did God force Adam and Eve? He didn't force them. He gave them choices and decisions and options. The options and choices and decisions you make are a reflection of where you're at spiritually. They yielded to temptation in that garden. Amen. Come, come Wednesday night. If you're able to come Wednesday night, come back Wednesday night. We're going to talk about the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible starts in a garden, and Christ is in a garden. We're going to read that, John 18, and a bunch of passages on Wednesday night. We'll talk about the garden and the prayer, the prayer time. Amen. Tell you, it's wonderful. Wonderful. Amen. You can't get enough of the Word of God. Amen. You're there waiting on me still. 1 Timothy 6. If you ever read 1 Timothy chapter 6, you know this. Here's some more passages before we get to verse 17. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Live godly. Are you content with what you got? Well, I got to get the iPhone 14 now, you know, uh, or I got to get the Samsung, what's the new one, S23, or, you know, our TV's like a 50 inch. Well, I got to get the 75 if there's such a thing. If the thing you got is working, don't go and buy another one. <laughs> Why waste God's money? On something that's working. Amen. Oh boy, I tell you, some people don't like that one. Amen. I have the tools, I have the things and laptop and cell phone. I keep on getting kudo loyalty. Bling, bling. Psst, cancel. You know. I don't need I know what they're gonna say. We can do this, we can do this, but they want me to, yeah, sign up for something else. This thing's paid for. Praise God, it's mine. It's actually his. I don't need anything else. It's working. It does the job. Oh, this one has five lenses on it. 200 megapixel. You know how big those files are? You better have a huge card. You better have lots of RAM. Man, I'll tell you, that'll eat up all your memory. <laughs> I like those pictures. Yeah, you're paying for it too. You won't have much room for anything else in that little device of yours. Listen, you just be, be content. That's what... Paul wrote to Timothy, he's a pastor, he says, Paul, godliness with contentment is great gain. Boy, you're rich in God's eyes if you live godly and you are content with what you got. Amen? And he says, watch this, for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we cannot, can carry nothing out. How did you come? Yeah, I won't say, you know how, I call it the birthday suit. You came, that's how you came in, you're going back out. Yeah, they're going to dress you up in that casket. Amen? But you know what? There's no, there's no U-Haul. There's no following the hearse. Amen? It's gone. If you're a child and your parents are still alive, amen, the things that they like, you may not like. You look through that stuff and say, I don't, I don't know why they kept that. You know? They may go to, I was going to say Goodwill, but they don't think they exist anymore around here. You might send it for Bibles for Missions or Missions Mark. I call it Bibles for Missions. I know it's not. I just, that, I'm stuck on that. Beacon House, Goodwill, Salvation Army. It might end up there. Or it might just end up in a dumpster outside the house. It was value to you, but your kids might not value what you value. It was precious to you. I'm not saying parents, okay, grandparents, don't get mad at me. I'm one of them too. Amen, and I understand that, and I need to work on that myself. But the reality is this. It's just life. It's not pleasant maybe right now to think about it. Amen? But you know what? He says, having food and raiment, verse 8, let us be content. And he talks about the temptation of money in verse 9. Verse 10, off, always misquoted. Money's the root of all evil, many people say, especially lost people. Uh -uh. The love of money is the root of all evil. Amen? And then, so there's a lot. That's a whole chapter there, but look down to verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Don't think you're something big and special because the brains that you have, God gave them to you. He gave you that ability. Everybody has different abilities. 
You know, that just that's the way life is. I mean, I was shocked to hear and watching some things there a couple of weeks ago and how that a lot of universities don't even do the SATs anymore. That's what I'm used to. I don't know if they do that in Canada, but I live in the States. If you want to go to university, you better be on the high percentiles to go into some of these universities. They don't take anybody in a, outside of that percentile. You're, you're, nowadays, they're not. They say, no, we can't do that. It's not very fair. Yes, it is. Everybody doesn't have the same ability. Jesus even said that. You can't put everybody... I don't know about you, but I... The doctor that does my wife's cataract surgery had to be bumped up to April here. I hope that guy passed everything. I hope he just didn't get the job because he was of a certain category of people in there. I want the person who knows. It doesn't matter what race they are, what their background, as long as they know the stuff and they can do it, that's the person I want to do the surgery. But we live in a world that's changing so much. No, it's like we got to include this person. I don't want no doctor. I don't want nobody. They better know their stuff. Doesn't matter. Hey Amen. Put a blindfold. Doesn't matter what they look like, the person looks like. Do they know what they're talking about and what they're going to do? Are they qualified? Bible works on qualifications. God hasn't changed on that. The world's changing on that. It's sad. They're dumbing down people. It's what they're doing in universe. A lot of them have to take some classes that they should have learned in sec high school. That's a shame. You know how much money it's costing parents and grandparents to put their kids through school and they're paying for stuff that was free in the public education system? Wow. That's sad. Some of you immigrants, you might say, I don't know about that. I've never heard of all that. That's, that's North America. I can't speak for your country, folks, but I can speak for Canada and U.S. because I live in both places. And it's happening. It's happening. Amen? Where the world is changing. Educational system is changing. He says this, that you be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in what? In the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God says, I want you to enjoy what I've given you. Are you enjoying what God's blessed you with? Or are you... Uh, Teach those kids. I'm sorry, I got to hit the kids again here. Kids, grandkids, parents, you got to make them accountable to this. Oh, I don't like that. You better deal with that. That was given out of a heart of love. You know what, kids? You got to understand something. You don't always get the designer clothes. Ouch, that hurt, Pastor. No, you don't. I want the designer clothes. I want this. I want that. That sounds like gimme, gimme, gimme. You should be thankful for what you got. You got, I don't know about some of you, I'll, I'll give away my, my, my era, amen? I wore patches, real patches. There was a period of time where people just put patches to make it look in style, but I wore them because there was holes in the elbows of my shirts. There was holes in my socks. I had to put patches on my pant knees. We just didn't go out and buy a pair of pants. We put patches my mom mended the socks. We're spoiled rotten in 2023. Was I, did that affect me mentally? And No, we lived through that. I was happy to play outside. I know that electronic stuff is like, I love it when I see kids playing outside. You know, during COVID, there was a lot of people walking. I said, wow, that's so wonderful to see all these people walking. Instead of glued to a device. That's our world in 2023. Get some fresh air. Get out there. Go for a walk. Hey, Amen. I mean, if there's, I don't know what the temperature's supposed to be like today. Go for a walk. Get bundled up. What a, this winter is amazing. Man, I just, it's easy on my back. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Enjoy. God wants you to enjoy life. He just wants you to recognize, it came from me now. Don't forget that. I gave it to you. I blessed you with that. Amen. I know. Move on, Pastor. Please, please, move on. Amen. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. And we're done. I know. You can only last so long. Sitting on... Actually, there. I was going to say we had the pews. Amen. Remember the pews, everybody? Amen. They were... I really tortured you. That was a lot of torture, the pews, <laughs> especially if you have a bad back.
But these chairs, they're a lot better, amen. I know it's still challenging to sit. Just pretend you're in the movie theater or something watching a show for an hour and a half. We're not there. Amen. Oh, wow. It's not about me. I'm not saying focus on me. Focus on what God's saying here through me to you. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. Amen? So Genesis chapter 2. So what we've seen so far is that be grateful and content. A steward is grateful and content. A steward gives willingly. A steward can enjoy the blessings of stewardship. Just stewarding the money, allocating, managing it. Being a help and blessing to others. Amen? You can do that if you want to. And last of all, let's not get, ever forget this. I've seen people, they miss, miss, miss quote this part. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden. I bracketed this phrase, to dress it and keep it. Just in case you don't understand what those words mean, I'll identify for you. Work. Wait a minute, work before the fall? Yes. If you know your Bible, work came before the fall. The problem is not work. Well, what happened over there in the next chapter, Pastor? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. You know what God wants? Realize that work is a gift from God. You can work. We've come to a point in the last couple of years where people just don't want to work. Listen, I'm not down anybody who legitimately needs uh, social assistance, um, unemployment, you know, all that kind of stuff. Amen. God bless you if you legitimately need it. But if you can work, you should work. That's how I was brought up and raised, and that's what the Bible teaches. As I mentioned at 10 a.m., if you don't work in the early church, you wouldn't even be allowed to come to the fellowship supper. Because that was a sin to be lazy if you don't want to work. Now, if you have a health problem, you've got a disability, I understand. Amen? That's different. God bless you. You can't work, literally. But there's a difference between you can't and you don't want to. But work is a gift from God. You can work with your hands. You know, God bless you. You can do that. Amen? So look at Genesis chapter 3. So we can say so much more. We can't. We've got to wrap this up here. Amen. You're getting, you know, don't worry, Pastor. You've got to get it over with here. Amen. I know. Amen. So then God made Eve. Amen? He made Eve after he said to Adam, you've got a responsibility. Adam, to dress and keep the garden, to work in there. I've given you a job. He didn't say, well, what's the hourly rate, Lord? No, he just did it. Because it's work. It's worthy. There is worth to it. I understand that. Labor is worthy of the reward. Yeah, I understand that. But work, work. So in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says here, look at this, verse 17. So after they, the sin in the garden, look in verse 17. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Oh, oh, oh. We won't get into that. But guys, there's a, guys, there's a time to hearken and there's a time not to hearken. I have a whole message I've done in our Genesis study about uh, Abraham and Sarah. There was a time Adam, God says, listen to your wife. In the matter of Hagar. And the other time, he shouldn't have. You know what? You got to get that thing straight. Amen? Your wives, your la the ladies here, you're married. They have some wisdom. We talked about that this morning a little bit. Amen? Hey, there's, we, got, we kind of compliment each other. We do. Now watch this. He says here, That was hearken on the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it in the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Watch this. In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat breast. What's that about? Now it's going to take a lot more labor to get the same yield out of the ground. That's what the curse was. It's not work. It's you're going to have to work a lot harder because that ground is now cursed. The work wasn't cursed. The ground is cursed. 
He says, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. That's what he said at the end of verse, and verse 19. The sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread, thou shalt return on the ground, for out of, out of it wast thou taken, dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So the Bible tells us, work is a gift. We talked about that Deuteronomy 8, 17. I quoted it a little bit, that God gives you the power to get wealth. What does that mean? You go to work and you earn it. But that's God's. Stewardship means really seeing our job as God's gift. You have a job? Be thankful for it. You want to change jobs? Better pray about it. You better seriously pray about it. Well, I think all the things you didn't like in that job, you might not see some things that you might find out later in that job that you might be saying the same tune again down the road. Well, I don't really like that. And you may be going from job to job to job. Sometimes I've found as pastors, some people that I've talked with, one-on-one -on -one with men a lot of times, it seems like their problems always follow them. And I say, look in the mirror. Sometimes it's a problem with authority. Some people just don't like people telling them what to do. You can't be the boss everywhere you go work. You gotta learn and understand that you're, you got a boss. You can't work for them, don't badmouth them. You better pray about what you're gonna do, but if you need to get another job, go get another job. Amen. But be thankful. God given you the ability to work. Work is a gift. Amen. Not only is work a gift, but steward. You're a steward. Enjoy the blessings of stewardship. You can, you can enjoy being a steward, being a manager of God's goodness that he's blessed you with. We give willingly, not grudgingly with a cheerful heart, amen? And if you can't give willingly, ask God to change your heart. It's a heart matter, it's what it is. I can't give, I can't give. Ask God to change your heart, amen? You should pray that prayer, change my heart, oh God, amen? And stewards need to be grateful and content, amen? We're stewards, not owners. Let's all stand, we'll close this morning.